咁我哋就開會啦。All right, um, I think we can start. Please invite the administration in. So may I welcome the administration's team led by Mr. Jackie Liu. Members, um, we um, have met um, the deputations and uh, many of them have also given us written submissions. The administration has provided us with um, its responses to the views of the deputations. So let's deal with that paper first. Mr. Liu. Yes, Chairman. Um, towards the end of last week, we issued a paper to members Um, uh, in fact, the um, Bills Committee received um, 13 um, um, written submissions from deputations uh, and um, we've provided uh, um, responses to uh, these submissions. In fact, um, um, there is unanimous support from the deputations on the legislative um, proposals. Um, they know that um, they are of the view that the development will result in a wider range of financial product offerings to the markets and uh, uh, will enhance the status of Hong Kong as an international financial centre and asset management centre. And in particular, this may give um, impetus to increasing demands for remember denominated uh, suku to match the uh, financing needs of fundraisers and the investment demand of investors in China, the Middle East, Southeast Asia and other parts of the world interested in Islamic financial products. And uh, some, um, some deputations have um, um, said that they um, wanted um, the bill to be passed as soon as possible um, so that um, um, the competitiveness of Hong Kong as a gateway for international Islamic finance can be maintained. So um, in some of the submissions, um, uh, they've indicated um, support for the religion-neutral approach adopted by the administration in drafting the bill. And they've also supported the broad coverage of the types of sukuk covered by the bill. And then there are some submissions which have um, set out um, some technical comments. Um, so uh, concerning um, qualifying conditions and tax administration matters, um, we've received um, views from some accountancy firms and uh, we've provided the detailed responses in um, Annex B. We are of the view that a reasonable balance needs to be struck in relation to market development on the one hand and anti-avoidance policy considerations on the other. In fact, um, we um, uh, try to take on board the suggestions um, um, when we um, drew up the bill. And that was after a consultation exercise in March 2012. Um, in NX um, we um, um, provide detailed responses to um, comments from deputations on uh, particular provisions in the bill. So, Chairman, perhaps um, we can um, um, deal with um, the administration's um, responses when we um, come to the um, relevant um, clause in the bill, right? Members, do you have any um, um, particular views or comments concerning the administration's responses? Um, I think uh, we can um, deal with the administration's responses um, 
when we come to the relevant clauses. Legal advisor, um, uh, I want to uh, ask a question about the first point um, in NXP, contract of indemnity. Uh, are we talking about the fault risk for derivatives? Um, for example, if uh, a property is uh, leased out and then um, there is a contract of indemnity so that if the tenant defaults in rent payment, he can still get some income uh, so as to um, help him pay the uh, relevant amounts when they are due. So um, will you regard that as a contract of indemnity? I think uh, we're not talking about insurance. Um, for insurance, we're talking about, uh, say, losses um, incurred if there is a fire. Uh, with regard to swap contracts, as um, mentioned by the legal advisor, I don't think they are covered under these sections. But then I, I think I need to check and double check with my colleagues. Ms. Chen? As Mr. Liu has pointed out, Chairman, we've uh, looked at um, offering circulars of products in the market and we've um, um, not seen the uh, scenario outlined by the legal advisor, but we can go back and check. Now, insurance is, uh, mainly relates to uh, the damage of assets and the compensation um, um, payable uh, or to be paid. Right. Um, let's uh, continue uh, our clause by clause study. Uh, clause four, uh, schedule seventeen A. Yes. Um, please, Mr. Liu. Uh, we completed sections one to eleven of section uh, schedule seventeen A, and we'll start from um, section twelve. And may I refer to the blue bill? Um, page C, 1227. Um, so uh, that's um, section 12. Um, last time we discussed the different investment arrangements concerning alternative bond schemes. And now um, section 12 is about qualified bond arrangement. and um, uh, qualified investment arrangement in specified alternative bond scheme. All alternative bond schemes have to satisfy the uh, conditions in Division 3 uh, before there can be exemption arrangements under the Inland Revenue Ordinance. So um, Section 12 um, contains the uh, conditions. For qualified bond investment arrangement and uh, uh, investment arrangement and qualified bond arrangement. Subsection one. Now, um, the conditions include reasonable commercial return condition, the bond arrangement as financial liability condition, Hong Kong connection condition. Maximum term length condition and arrangements performed according to terms condition. And um, the details will be contained in section 13. So this is just the, um, just to um, outline the um, five conditions to be satisfied. 
And then subsection two, two conditions um, in order that um, 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 it is a qualified investment arrangement. Uh, bond issuer as conduit condition and the investment arrangement as financial liability condition. And we will also be explaining these conditions later in this um, division. And then subsection 3 and 4 uh, mention exceptions. If there are Qualified bond arrangements and qualified investment arrangements. And then if um, the conditions are violated, then um, that will be, th these will be called BA disqualifying event and IA disqualifying event. And so the entire um, bond arrangement and investment arrangement will be deemed to have never satisfied the uh, relevant conditions under the IRO. In other words, exemptions under the IRO which have been granted uh, will be withdrawn um, unless in the exceptional situation under Section 27. And that is um, after the maturity period that debt issuer may um, um, so everything, but then he may, he may not be able to complete the process within 30 days or the uh, time needed is uh, longer than expected. And that's why in Section 27, we give the um, IRD some flexibility. So the commissioner can exercise uh, discretion if there are reasonable grounds uh, for, for this. So in subsection 3 and subsection 4, it's stated that they are subject to subsection 27, meaning that if uh, section 27 applies, we will not regard uh, the dis this as, as being disqualified. So this is a general uh, provision setting out the, uh, the way the different conditions are called and then we'll go over the conditions one by one in subsequent provisions. Yes, uh, members? Uh, Mr. Kenneth Lo? Chairman, thank you. I have a question about 12. It's rather long. Uh, first thing first, I'm uh, reading the English version. Line 3, at any time, bracket, material time. Can you tell us uh, where can I find the definition of material time? Thank you, Chairman. Material time's definition appears here, and actually in uh, section 4, C1195. And last time we did discuss uh, the meaning of material time. Material time means any time. We give this a label called material time. From some time to any time, which is called material time in this bill. So from the very start up to a certain time, the alternative uh, point scheme must fulfill the, the five conditions, five by A, B, C, D, E, before it's uh, regarded as a qualified uh, point arrangement. We just call it material time. Actually, during the consultation, I also read the, the bill drafting aside. Are we saying that from the very beginning to, to the maturity period, at any time, let's say the qualified bond arrangement has to comply with A, B, C, D, E, the five conditions during the uh, entire uh, life, the duration, 
for example, reasonable return condition as a qualifying factor. If at some other, some other time the qualified bond arrangement does not comply with this, uh, then the tax exemption status will, will not be granted. Is there any chance for the uh, issuer, bond issuer, to rectify problems? That's the crux of uh, my question. Mr. Liu? Uh, yes, Mr. Leung's understanding is correct. The bond arrangement from the very beginning up to maturity must comply with all the relevant uh, conditions before it is uh, regarded as a uh, uh, recognized debt arrangement in the IRO. If uh, in the meantime there has been changes, there has been any, a change to the uh, term, or they are not doing things according to the offering uh, circular, and they have come up with something different, then uh, the uh, it would not be regarded as a relevant uh, debt uh, arrangement, and then uh, no uh, tax exemption will be offered. No waiver will be provided. So the understanding of Mr. Leung is correct that uh, that. Uh, compliance has to be sure all the time. Or if there is any any disqualifying if event, then it will uh, evoke a subsection three or subsection four. If there is a disqualifying event, the arrangement would uh, be regarded as never having been a qualifying a qualified arrangement. So the all in all, compliance must be the ensured at all time. In other words, the bond issuer will not be given any chance to ratify uh, anything that is not in compliance. If there's a disqualifying event, uh, the relevant parties must inform the IOD at advance, so they will have no chance to do any re uh, ratification. If there's an administrative oversight, of, uh, there will be no chance to rectify the mistake. So that they would be qualified, they would be qualified once again. Don't you think this is too strict? Well, we have uh, considered uh, what chances and what scenarios uh, would uh, come under this. When an issuer issue bonds in accordance with the uh, original terms, and then uh, quite maybe at some at some point down the road, uh, they may uh, have done something which. Makes it uh, unqualified, and that's why in uh, section 27, when uh, the maturity period is up, and when the assets uh, are sold off, and that takes time, so uh, we believe uh, the uh, commissioner of inland revenue must be given power to exercise these questions. Maybe the assets cannot be sold in good time, the, the uh, maturity has expired. So the, under such uh, reasonable circumstances, uh, exemptions uh, can be granted by the ILD. So we, we think that uh, if the issuer uh, wants to comply, uh, there's no way that uh, all of a sudden uh, that if he later finds that uh, he cannot comply, and uh, for example the uh, risk the commercial t return condition is no longer reasonable. Now we are not going to provide exemption for these uh, cases. Otherwise, uh, there's a a tax uh, evasion problem or potential problem in uh, Schedules seventeen uh, a. Actually, in the previous uh, consulting consultation exercise, some participants uh, raised the uh, problems with uh, not being able to sell off the assets in good time. Well, we have to look at the uh, mistakes made. Uh, whether they have uh, misunderstood the qualifying uh, conditions or what. We may continue. Section 13. 
uh, there are more uh, people who have commented on this than others. That is uh, the condition of reasonable commercial return. The return uh, must be a reasonable commercial return. That is, it should not be exceeding an amount that would be a reasonable commercial return on money borrowed of an amount equal to the bond proceeds. When deputations came, a number of them uh, commented on this, including uh, the Law Society, two com accounting firms, and another accounting f body. This condition is not about uh, restricting the commercial return rate of uh, Islam Islamic bonds, but this is actually something market-led. And we are not also trying to uh, prevent the issuer from giving the investor a higher return. Uh, th there is a mechanism in the market to adjust uh, the return in the light of the prevailing risk. But we must have this reasonable commercial return conditions uh, impose this. Because uh, in the concept of a suku, it doesn't really just cover debt uh, arrangements and bonds in relation to debt arrangement. Under the idea, some suku may be equity linked or it's about equity finance. Tax exemption of uh, to debt arrangement is for debt arrangement only. So we have to be very careful that uh, to cover some debt arrangement under Islamic finance to the debt arrangement uh, mentioned in the ILO. Well, the Commissioner will look at the uh, coupon rate to see if uh, the arrangement of the return uh, f far exceeds the market commercial return. If uh, a similar uh, capital raising body with a similar credit rating paying, uh, say, one percent of interest of return, but if this commercial, re uh, this uh, bond arrangement under this section offers twenty percent, then it will be uh, out not in line with uh, a debt arrangement. A bond arrangement here, it would be more like equity with a sharing of um, returns, and uh, in the traditional sense, and therefore not a subject, not uh, applicable to the uh, tax exemption. That's why we we make it a condition that we we'll look at uh, that the uh, commercial return here is uh, comparable and reasonable before we regard uh, this as being satisfied. But I, we can assure the Bills Committee and the market that this uh, reasonable commercial return condition is nothing new. Under the stamp duty ordinance, uh, there are, there's a definition of a loan capital, and uh, there's also a similar reasonable commercial return condition. Uh, the Commissioner for Stamp Duty will look at this. Under the Stamp Duty Ordinance, uh, cap, cap, capital costs ca can be exempt from stamp duty. But if the commercial return is uh, not uh, reasonable, the, com the Commissioner can decide not to offer exemption of stamp duty. The definition has been in use since 1981, and it has been uh, working well. So I think market players don't have to be unduly worried that in handling suku uh, and apply these conditions, it would be problematic. Well, the commissioner has uh, a, 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 
agree to issue guidance notes and uh, practice notes, the so-called DIPN, to explain in detail how this condition is to be applied in the future. And uh, it's also uh, going to be provided uh, for reference by the market. It's a learn. I'm glad that the, to learn from the Bureau that a DIPM will be issued by the ILRT. One clarification here. Will the DIPN, DIPN covers all autonomous uh, bond scheme, not just on the reasonable commercial return condition, right? Another point about section 13, bracket 2 and bracket 3. Why are there two subsections to deal with uh, similar things? Uh, 13.2, the commission is satisfied in each period ending on a scheduled payment date, but 13.3, uh, 13 in each period ending on an actual payment date is the wording used. So the wording is somewhat different, but they are talking about similar things. Why do we need to, to have two subsections? Can the Bureau uh, elaborate and explain? Yes, certainly. Thank you, Mr. Leung. Uh, 13 bracket 2 and 13 bracket 3 are talking about similar but different things. For subsection 2, in the off it's about the uh, expected uh, return on uh, payment day, on a scheduled payment day in the offering circular. For example, the offer uh, offering circular will talk about the uh, interest, the percentage of the interest. It will be listed in the circular, and the commissioner will take a look at this. And then uh, bracket three is about the actual interest pay. If uh, it's not uh, done strictly in line with the offering circular, then we'll look at the actual uh, interest paid. So we'll also consider the actual interest pay. And this is to prevent uh, someone from doing from from us, uh, setting out something in the circular, but doing some other thing not exactly the same in 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 reality. So we have to read uh, subsection two and subsection three together. The commissioner would uh, continue and uh, keep uh, monitoring the uh, interest payment. Thank you. Uh, for the bond instrument, if it doesn't pay um, a dividend, and then um, some money um, is uh, paid out, uh, um, and that is the redemption amount, and this um, redemption amount is uh, calculated on a basis of a formula, then, Chairman, then can I ask the uh, uh, Bureau this question? If it's a redemption, uh, then, then of course, as a future event, we don't know um, um, the amount arising from the uh, calculation according to the formula. So, how can you uh, ensure that um, you can uh, that, that the uh, com uh, commercial return condition can be met? Let's say if um, the product is, is of um, uh, of uh, uh, as for a five-year period. Then usually, during that period, there will be dividends um, paid to investors on on a regular basis. But if um, um, there are no dividends in the interim, and then uh, finally a higher redemption amount is paid, then that will be covered by the formula under. Um, Subsection five, because A is the redemption payment. So even if the dividend is in the form of a higher uh, um, uh, level of redemption payment, we will still be able to see that. But then before the product is launched, the underwriter uh, will definitely uh, make an application first. The underwriter may be a lawyer. So what if the amount A can only be determined, five years, say, five years later? So do you have a mechanism uh, whereby you can grant um, interim exemptions? That's my question. Yes, thank you. 
uh, concerning Islamic bonds um, that can um, satisfy the conditions, um, they uh, uh, um, usually um, um, make it clear right at the outset the return, for example, based on high ball or lie ball. So um, it's unlikely that you know the dividends um, um, not initially. But then, of course, if the issuer um, has um, doubts, then, of course, he can apply for an advanced ruling uh, from the IRD under Section 88A of the uh, IRO. So the issuer uh, should be clear about the um, taxation situation, and this will also be included, I think, in the offering circular. So the issuer should know very well that if um, he issues um, bonds um, in Hong Kong and if there is to be um, transfer of assets then concerning the uh, taxation implications, um, he, he should be able to know that very well. So advanced ruling under Section 88A is, um, a, is commonly uh, used by um, those in the market. Chairman. Uh, concerning advanced ruling under Section 88A, can I ask this question? Now, is it that for Islamic bonds, um, um, the issuer must um, um, act under Section 88A, or can the issuer say that, um, in fact, um, exemptions have already been granted for similar products, and so I don't need to obtain an advanced ruling? Is it that um, obtaining an advanced ruling is um, essential and necessary, or is it uh, okay um, if um, similar products in the market have got uh, um, exemptions, and so there's no need to apply for um, advanced ruling? Can I uh, invite the IRD to give a reply? Yes, Chairman. Applying for an advanced ruling is not um, essential or mandatory because we do charge uh, a fee um, for dealing with such an application. But if the issuer is of the view that the Islamic bonds in question are similar to um, other products in the market, then they can uh, the issuer can choose not to apply for an advanced ruling. Now, in fact, uh, the IPN will be issued by the um, commissioner after the passage of the bill. And so the market should know very well what the level of return will be regarded um, as reasonable by the uh, commissioner. So the, the, uh, I don't think that there will be any um, misunderstanding or confusion in this regard. Sorry, the speaker is not coming through. Sorry, the speaker is not coming through. Yes, perhaps I can say a little bit more about redemption. In fact, Islamic bonds um, are, are similar to traditional bonds or conventional bonds for zero coupons. There will be redemption plus a premium. Say if the issue price is one hundred dollars, and then it may be um, one hundred and two dollars upon maturity or redemption, and the two dollar difference will be regarded as the um, return. And we will, from day one, um, know whether the return is a is a reasonable level of return. Um, Chairman, what if um, he doesn't say it's one hundred and two dollars? What if he says it's um, uh, inflation rate plus um, three percent, and then there is a formula? Yes, I understand that if there is any doubt or uncertainty, an advanced ruling can be sought by the issuer, and I hope that um, you can um, um, state this mechanism very clearly in the DIPN. And uh, after the passage of the bill, um, uh, when, when will the DIPN be issued? Um, you, you mean the DIPN um, should be available um, upon the commencement um, of the legislation for the benefit of the issuers? All right, I think we can continue. Uh, uh, Mr. Liu, uh, uh, or, or legal advisor, yes, I, I want to ask one question, Chairman. Uh, Jaira, um, um, all right. Uh, buying a property, leasing it out, and then um, 
uh, selling the property to repay the um, principal. But then, say after 15 years, the um, property may have appreciated uh, very, very uh, significantly and substantially. And and what if? So is it that? The um, final payment has to be um, limited. Now, um, now usually, um, uh, um, usually uh, that will state the amount to be uh, paid um, fifteen years later for buying back. It's usually the principal. The prin um, Yes. Um, section fourteen. I think this is um, easy to understand. The issuer. Uh, has to um, treat um, the scheme as a financial liability. So um, this has to be done in accordance with the uh, Hong Kong Financial Reporting Standards issued by the HKICPA or the International Financial Reporting Standards issued by the uh, IAS Board. And we believe um, this is a condition that issuers can easily meet. Then section 15, Chairman, Mr. Sin Chong Kai. Um, um, is there a need to amend the legislation? I, I beg your pardon? Because you need to adopt uh, the two sets of standards. What if the two sets of standards um, are amended? Mr. Liu, now if the two sets of standards are amended, or even if they are amended, um, um, bond issuance um, um, in accounting terms is um, will, will still be treated as a financial liability. But of course, in future, if um, bond issuance is no longer regarded as financial liability, then we will have to uh, amend the legislation. But I want to say that bond issuance is regarded as financial liability on the balance sheet. And so we'll give approval um, if um, the bond issuance is um, financial liability on the balance sheet. Then why is it that you need to include Roman one and Roman two under A, Mr. Liu? For companies incorporated in Hong Kong, they need to act in accordance with the um, reporting standards issued by the HKICPA or the IAS Board. For Foreign issuers although they are not uh, adopting existing Hong Kong or uh, international standards now what um, then we will um, um, give the flexibility under B would be treated as the financial liability of the bond issuer if the bond issuer applied those standards. In other words, assuming that the issuer adopts um, Hong Kong standards or the IAS board um, standards. So um, my question is, you can delete um, uh, Roman 1 and Roman 2 under 14A, then there will not be any standards to go by. I think the only thing you need is financial liability. In other words, bond issuance is regarded as financial liability. That's the most important thing, Ms. Lee. Mr. Sin, in fact, under the uh, financial reporting standards, there is a definition for financial liability. And... Um, we have included these two sets of standards because they do contain a definition for financial liability so that everyone will be um, looking at the same definition for financial liability. Mr. Long.
uh, can I ask uh, um, in which FRS financial liability appears? 32. Um, the, in the, there is a definition for financial liability. That's 32. Contractual obligation to deliver cash or any other or another financial asset to another entity or to exchange financial assets or financial liabilities with another entity under the conditions that are potentially unfavorable to the entity or a contract that will be uh, will or may be settled in the entity's own equity instrument and is a non-derivative for which the entity is or may be obliged to deliver a variable number of entity's own equity instruments. Okay. Uh, Now, in fact, these financial reporting standards are widely used in Hong Kong and in other uh, international financial centers. In fact, we've uh, communicated with um, accountancy firms and the HKICPA, and uh, they are of the view that this um, uh, section will not pose any difficulty to um, issuers or their uh, accountants. And for uh, Islamic bonds, um, they appear on the balance sheets as financial liabilities. Section 15. The alternative bond scheme, uh, if uh, it's, it wants to be exempted under the RLO, there must be a condition or met here, that is the Hong Kong connection conditions, and there are four factors, and they don't have to have to fulfill all four. They can just uh, fulfill one of the four. For example, uh, listed is listed on a stock exchange in Hong Kong, uh, or the um, Bonds are issued in good faith in the course of carrying on business in Hong Kong, or they are marketed in Hong Kong, or they are lodged uh, with the essential money markets units operated by the uh, monetary authority. Any one of the four would qualify the arrangement as having Hong Kong connection. This is also reasonable because the tax exemption is over to facilitate our financial market in the issuance of uh, Islamic bonds and also for the pur for purpose of promotion of Islamic bonds in Hong Kong. So the issuer must comply or fulfill one of the four conditions before we consider that the, uh, the bond issuance really to promotes the uh, financial Islamic bond market in Hong Kong. So s somehow the issuers must have uh, some connection with Hong Kong. Well, there's a, a discrepancy between the Chinese and the English version. Marketing is rendered as siu sao or sold. I'm speaking just uh, at my mind. The bonds may be marketed in Hong Kong, but the sale takes place, say, in uh, Malaysia. It's marketed in uh, English, but sales uh, or sell or sold in Hong Kong. Who can take this question? M marketed in Hong Kong can be found in Section 16 of the ILO. It's a uh, 2F under Section 16. A person, a bond issuer, can have uh, the uh, interest uh, deducted from tax calculation. And we uh, have uh, some conditions attached, and that is uh, issued in Hong Kong and marketed in Hong Kong. Is uh, marketed uh, means uh, buying and selling, and here uh, it means uh, sold, buying and selling in Hong Kong.
Well, that may be in the definition, but if but uh, the ordinary meaning of a uh, sell is a uh, buying and selling. The other is about marketing. Marketing meaning prom promotion. So you mean both uh, promotion and buying and selling? Yes. So you want to cover promotion or sell, not all and. But if it's uh, promoted in Hong Kong but not so in Hong Kong, then uh, it's not covered. But if it's uh, sold in Hong Kong, then you can buy it in Hong Kong. And uh, then it's, uh, I suppose, marketing in Hong Kong. Marketing must be uh, done before issuance. What if uh, after the promotion you are required to buy the bond in uh, Malaysia or Singapore? Mr. Liu? Well, the condition is about uh, selling in Hong Kong. Promotion is part of the selling process. You must do some road show to promote and to attract the product, uh, to attract investors, retail investors. So market uh, uh, covers promotion and also buying and selling. If it's just about uh, publicity, promotion, but no actual buying and selling in Hong Kong, then uh, it's uh, too low a threshold. But uh, that's, that's a discrepancy. Maybe we should uh, improve the English version. Sold and marketed in Hong Kong, perhaps? Or well, I can uh, uh, t take this up with the law draftsman and take another look at this word marketed to s make sure that uh, the word marketed and uh, the Chinese equivalent uh, siu sao can be better aligned. But the principle is uh, clear. We are talking about uh, buying and selling and uh, marketing and promotion in Hong Kong. And again, uh, that's also in line with the ILO uh, as far as a tax exemption for interest is concerned uh, in relation to uh, bond issuance. Pure promotion can be very simple and straightforward. Uh, put you put up an advertisement, and that that can that can be it. So that's not uh, about market development. We want to see transactions in Hong Kong before we regard that that there is a Hong Kong Hong Kong connection. Please clarify this. Yes, we'll see how we can uh, improve. So to make sure that uh, the meaning is uh, as intended. 15b, are issued in good faith and in course of carrying on business in Hong Kong. When you talk about the qualifying tax instrument, is there a similar thing? The same thing? Yes, yeah, section 16 of the main ordinance under subsection 2f, uh, paragraph 2. It also said uh, issued in good faith and in the course of uh, Carrying, carrying on, and marketed in Hong Kong. It's uh, in line with the uh, other provision under 2F of Section 16. So you are going to use good faith instead of bona fide? We don't use this term anymore. Maybe the law draftsman can offer us some advice. Bona fide is a somewhat archaic. To the ordinary reader, the meaning is not very clear. So we uh, go for uh, a, s a simpler the rendition, and we will use the uh, words uh, "good faith." Ah, uh, the sixth section. We have a short length condition. Section sixteen, maximum turn length condition. 
the alternative bond scheme uh, must not have a term length exceeding 15 years. Last March, when we consulted the market, the proposed maximum term uh, was not more than 10 years. We have uh, taken on board uh, market views that we should not uh, stifle the issuance of uh, longer term uh, bonds. So we have uh, extended this term length condition. To enjoy the exemption, the maximum term should not be more than 15 years. We have looked at the market. Most uh, Islamic bonds are shorter than uh, five years in term length. In the past 10 years, 90% of Islamic bonds worldwide uh, are under 15 years in term length. We will want to strike a balance uh, in promoting this and in avoiding tax evasion. We do not rule out that in the market in the future there will be uh, many or more bond schemes uh, exceeding 15 years in term length. That's why under subsection 2, the financial secretary will be empowered to uh, amend the period specified by notice published in the Gazette. So the FS can extend uh, the term beyond 15 years. But as market trend goes, 15 years seems to be an appropriate uh, maximum uh, term length. And we have uh, make an adjustment in, in, uh, in terms of a, or in response to market consultation. 17? 17. The bond arrangement and the investment arrangement must uh, comply with uh, Section 2 of this schedule and also the four investment arrangements, one of the four in Division 2. The provisions in that division must be complied with. To fulfill these uh, arrangements performed according to terms condition. But uh, there is also some flexibility here. In the case of uh, selling off uh, assets, uh, it may not be able to be completed. It may not be completed before a specified time limit. If there's a delay for not more than 30 days for the disposal of the asset, then uh, under section 17 bracket 2 compliance is uh, assumed. But we don't want to see the disqualification because of a minor breach. Legal advisor, I want a clarification here. If it's not because of the problem with the issuer, Let's say it's because the, there's some some problem with the asset in the arrangement, so that a timely payment cannot be made. Would that be regarded as a uh, breach? And that is, uh, the uh, payment arrangement cannot be complied with as a result. What would What would happen? The problem is not caused by the issuer. That, that is the question. If uh, there's a default or there's a problem, for example, is Jira, the talent doesn't pay rent, and there's no money to pay the money on schedule, or maybe in a country. There is a foreign exchange control system uh, recently introduced. Would uh, this be regarded as a uh, breach in Section 17? If there are unexpected uh, 
events. Well, it has. It would uh, depend. It would depend on whether such a condition must be complied with. So, if it's a con mandatory condition, there is a chance that uh, it can be disqualified for failure to make payment as scheduled. And uh, the taxpayer can seek an advance ruling to, uh, under Section 88A. Section 17 is an important condition. If the issuer uh, change the arrangements and uh, the arrangements are not in line with Section 2 and uh, Division 2 of the schedule, then uh, we are afraid that there is a loophole. Let's say the original maturity uh, date is for 10 years and there are changes to the financial situation of the issuer and the interest has to be paid later than the schedule. We we'll look at the date of uh, final redemption of all of an alternative bond. Let's say uh, if the original term is for ten years, it can be extended to twelve years, and we will not regard this as uh, a breach of the condition. All right, we can continue. Section eighteen. Bond issue as conduit condition, meaning that the uh, bond issuer is the one making the payment. There are bond arrangement and investment arrangement. The bond issuer is a special vehicle, special purpose vehicle, so that uh, the uh, investment, the leasing, and the buyback will be conducted in such a way that the uh, returns are given back to the investor and the investment return must not be bigger than the bond in return. So the uh, S special purpose vehicle uh, is used to uh, give the benefit back to the uh, investor. And he said this provision is um, important or else the bond issuer will uh, not be a special purpose uh, vehicle or company. Now, uh, uh, the investment return um, um, has to be, uh, as far as possible, uh, paid to the uh, investors. Okay. All right, um, section 19. Uh, like section 14, we um, require that for the investment arrangement, um, it, it should be a financial liability uh, for the originator in accordance with the um, Hong Kong Financial Reporting Standards or the International Financial Reporting Standards. Section 14 uh, is about the bond arrangement and a bond arrangement has to be financial liability uh, for the bond issuer and uh, section 19 is about um, treating the um, investment arrangement as financial ability in the balance sheet of the originator. Yes, section 20. Yes, Chairman, section 20 and also 21. Now, in the IRO, there are um, different provisions and we have to flex flexibly apply them to uh, qualified bond arrangements and qualified investment arrangements. Otherwise, concerning the dividends, the uh, costs incurred um, by the issuing of bonds and so on and so forth, they cannot be uh, treated as debt arrangements. And so sections 20 and 21 are deeming provisions. 
section uh, section 21. It says this ordinance applies with the modification set out in the section to a qualified bond arrangement in a specified alternative bond scheme. And then um, subsection 2. Um, the bond proceeds paid by the bondholders to the bond issuer under the qualified bond arrangement are to be regarded as money borrowed by the bond issuer from the bondholders. Um, this provision will give effect to um, the um, relevant um, provision in the IRO. So, um, bond proceeds um, paid by the bondholders to the bond issuer are to be regarded as money borrowed by the bond issuer from the bondholders. And then second, bondholders do not have legal or beneficial, in beneficial interest in the assets because uh, in, the tax, in the tax assessment process, we'll ignore the uh, transactions and so there is uh, 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 no existence of a trustee or any beneficial interest. And then uh, concerning sections 14A and 26A of the IRO, these are tax um, concessions and exemptions and the existing exemptions and um, concessions and they um, apply to the um, bonds in this part. So these alternative bonds are regarded as bonds uh, in the principal legislation. And then subsection 4, section 15 in the ordinance um, uh, for the benefit of, of all, for the purpose of um, charging profits tax, um, there are certain arrangements, and th these are sections uh, section fifteen L, J, K, and L, and these uh, will apply to Islamic bonds. Um, these are regarded as um, operating income. The next uh, additional payments uh, will be regarded as interest payable. And under Section 16.2F, there can be um, um, certain uh, deductions. And these deductions are comparable to those uh, applicable to conventional bonds. And then Section 20AC. Um, tax um, concessions for certain groups of people and um, this will uh, also apply to Islamic bonds. And then subsection 7, section 26A, the Islamic bonds are not regarded as a mutual fund or a unit trust under that section because it's a bond arrangement. Mr. Lau. Now for these subsections, if the Islamic bonds fulfill the criteria for a qualified debt instrument, then uh, 14A can apply. In other words, um, profits tax are halved. And then 24AC, is it about um, the uh, Offshore fund. I, I'm in fact talking about um, twenty um, oh, section twenty subsection six. So if there is an investment fund located overseas, and if the fund holds uh, qualified Islamic bonds, then that would um, satisfy the offshore fund exemption condition. Y yes, that's um, sec uh, the expanded uh, or modified application of Section 20AC to include uh, Islamic bonds as well.
Uh, section 20 is the deeming provision for uh, qualified bond arrangements. Uh, section 21 is the deeming provision for qualified investment arrangement. 2A, acquisition costs to be regarded as money borrowed by the originator from the bond issuer. The investment return payable is to be regarded as interest payable on the money borrowed by the originator from the bond issuer. So this is um, similar to the arrangement for um, bond arrangement. And then the bond issuer concerning the asset transactions, they, they will be disregarded. So concerning the buying and selling of the assets and the um, profits tax um, income, now there will be be uh, exemption under section three, section uh, 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 subsection three. Subsection three is that we will uh, just um, ignore the uh, transactions, and then uh, section seven of uh, schedule the business undertaking and also profit sharing concerning the um, asset transaction with the originator under four B. Such asset transactions will be um, disregarded. As for the transactions, they are regarded as acquired by the originator directly from the third party. And concerning the expenditure, gain and loss, income, those will be regarded as the profit, interest, gains, uh, lo losses and income of the originator. And then E, um, properties tax. Because 5B um, of the ordinance is about payment of property tax. But then concerning the lease arrangements and the buying back arrangement, so you know there will be um, leasing and uh, leasing back. So these will be uh, disregarded. So for uh, un under e of, uh, Section 5, the uh, pro pro uh, property tax will be um, um, waived. And then uh, subsection 6. As under part two of schedule seventeen or division two of schedule seventeen. In fact we, we um already dealt with that last time. Then subsection seven alternative bonds they regard that uh for uh, uh, uh to regard as debentures or instruments. So 16.2F will also cover alternative bonds and the um, dividend or interest uh, deductions. Mr. C, uh, I can't follow. Uh, uh, 21.3, what is meant by O? What is meant by B? I O means originator. Uh, uh, there, uh, this is in the, in the interpretation section. And then B I, bond issuer. Uh, BI is the special purpose vehicle, the, the conduit or the issuer. O and BI uh, for the specified um, asset transactions, uh, these have already been defined. For example, specified asset transactions between O and BI, that's in fact in section 73B. And that's page C1205. Uh, um, concerning the invest, uh, investment arrangements and the asset transactions, under sections 3 and 4, they will all be disregarded. And as a result, the uh, profits tax can also be waived or exempted. Yes, please continue. So we've already completed Division 3, and now it's Division 4 miscellaneous. Um, giving the power to the FS to amend Division 2 to include new investing arrangements, as members may recall. Um, um, this um, piece of legislation only covers the five 
most common um, arrang- types of investment arrangements. They are um, sections six to nine. But then, as you know, Islamic um, if investment products um, keep developing, and so there may be a uh, new um, types of investment arrangements. And we hope that the financial secretary can through subsidiary legislation include the new investment arrangements and products. And of course, they can also specify which types of transactions can enjoy tax concessions or exemptions. And with regard to amendment to the schedule, Um, there can also be amendments to the uh, con- table of content uh, uh, in section one of the schedule. In fact, the market welcomes this approach because when there are new products uh, available in the market, we can very promptly uh, respond to the uh, the change. All right, I think we can now move on to part three. Oh, let's uh, have a few pings of the schedule. Part three, record keeping. Notification, tax assessment, and other miscellaneous matters. Now, please uh, slow down. I can't follow. Uh, under Division 4, the FS can amend Division 2, right? Division Is Division 2 in the May ordinance? Well, we are talk, talking about Schedule 17A. Section 17A is subsidiary legislation. Is this subsidiary legislation? Uh, f- yes, in the form of uh, subsidiary legislation. It's uh, C1195 to, to C1227. We have covered the most uh, common arrangements, which are commonly uh, adopted. But we cannot rule out that there will be new arrangements in the future. That's why we want to empower the FS to add new investment arrangements. But of course, uh, such a piece of subsidiary legislation is subject to negative vetting of the Council. You can amend the subsidiary legislation any time you want, uh, with or without this provision. There's no specific provision to uh, amend Schedule 17A. That's why we want to set out that the FS can amend the uh, schedule as subsidiary leg- legislation. Of course, we do not rule out uh, that the Council can also uh, make similar amendments or same amendments. Equal advice, huh? you want to say something? Well, this is to empower the FS to amend Schedule 17A in the principal uh, ordinance by notice published in the Gazette. We must uh, give the FS this power, otherwise uh, the amendment would come in the form of a bill. But with this provision, uh, the amendment can be made uh, in the form of a subsidiary legislation. And we are not even talking about the uh, entire Schedule 78, but just a few provisions in uh, Division 2 for the FS to uh, come up with a new uh, arrangements apart from the four already covered. The FS can uh, inc- include new arrangements. It's not that the FS can, uh, through subsidiary legislation, amend Schedule 17A any way he likes. And the subsidiary legislation is also subject to a negative vetting by the Council. And there will be sufficient time for scrutiny in the council. All right, we can uh, move on to part three. Part three: record keeping, notification assessments, and other miscellaneous matters. Section twenty-three. 
interpretation for this particular part. Yi. I can understand one, two, but B is very wide. Make amendments to section one of this schedule if the amendments are consequential on or necessary as a result of any amendments made under paragraph A. I don't know what products uh, will uh, re give rise to consequential amendments or what they are. Actually, section one of this schedule is a table of content or uh, an interpretation. Please turn to C1179. Section 1 is uh, interpretation, setting out the terms used in the schedules 17A so that people know uh, where to cross-reference such terms. So Section 1 is just a table. If there's a new investment arrangement introduced, then we need to uh, make a consequential amendment. Uh, to the table. It's just an interpretation uh, clause. Uh, so there's no need to worry that uh, through uh, an amendment to section 1 uh, we would be amending anything uh, substantive. Because if we want to move any substantive amend amendment, uh, we will have to present a bill, an amendment bill, to this council. Alright, so that's clear. Section 23. Section 23 is an interpretation clause for this particular part. Specify assessment and specify events, and here we have the uh, definitions. If a taxpayer makes a BA claim, and that is he claims that the arrangement is a qualifying uh, is a qualifying bond arrangement. So, if a person, a taxpayer, who has made a BA claim in claiming the investment arrangement is a qualifying uh, investment scheme, well, this is to tie in with uh, the operation of sections twenty four to twenty seven. And uh, subsequent uh, sections would uh, refer back to this uh, section, section 23. Section 24, records to be kept. Subsection 2 requires that the issuer or the originator must keep the transaction records in accordance with section 51C of the ordinance. For seven years, after the completion of the transactions, or the expiry of three years after the end of the uh, specified uh, term of the scheme, whichever comes later. If the uh, Islamic bonds uh, term is for three years, and the final redemption transaction uh, will be. Three plus seven, and or three plus three, in uh, as far as uh, record keeping is concerned. This has to do with the record keeping the requirement in Section Fifty One C. During the consultation, some accountancy firms asked if we could uh, reduce the uh, record keeping period. Actually, originally it was seven years. After the completion of the transactions, or seven years after the expiry of the term of the scheme, having considered market views, we have uh, lower the requirement, the length of uh, the period uh, in B, and that is uh, the expiry of three years after the end of the scheme. We want to provide a maximum uh, flexibility. To the market without affecting the IOD's uh, ability to assess tax. According to some market players, uh, they are not going to uh, throw away the transaction records. Likely, 
I think we have uh, achieved the uh, best uh, balance under Section 24. Mr. Leung, 24.1a is a condition. A person who carries on a trade profession or business in Hong Kong and uh, a person who makes a BA claim or IA claim and uh, is someone who is uh, doing this uh, in a trade profession or business. If the born has a Hong Kong connection, it can be qualified as an Islamic born. In 24.1a, you require this, and that is a trade profession or business in Hong Kong. Say if you are an overseas issuer, you must appoint someone in Hong Kong who carries on this as a trade profession or business. So are you saying that there must be an agent doing this uh, in Hong Kong? Section 24 is that uh, if there's no Hong Kong tax implication, there's no need to uh, keep records. For example, if uh, there's no pop, pop Hong Kong profit tax uh, implication, then and that's only a special purpose vehicle in Hong Kong, then the Section 24 will not apply. Well, in your case of Sukut, um, the underlying security is a Hong Kong listed company. I have to clarify my interest. I have been involved uh, in similar uh, uh, bond structured issuance and also a similar Islamic bond structure. If you, talk, you are talking about stamp duty, I think there's a similar requirement here. It's sort of uh, confusing. If the record keeping under 24A must be a person who carries on a trade profession or business in Hong Kong, I can understand it. If uh, because the person who is a person who carries on a trade profession or business in Hong Kong, there is a profit tax implication in Hong Kong. So I'm saying that if uh, there's no such implication, then Section 24 is not applied. Well, you must be someone who carries on a trade profession or uh, business if, before you are liable to uh, profit tax. Otherwise, there's no profit tax payable, or, or and there's no need to keep records. But for stamp duty, anyone, any issuer, or originator, who makes a BA claim or I claim, they must keep records for the purpose of stamp duty, because uh, we are talking about the uh, conveyance of uh, properties. In the in section 51C of the ordinance, we only require someone who paid who is uh, carrying on a trade uh, profession or business in Hong Kong to pay profit tax. We want to ally this with uh, the ordinance. We want to make sure that the offshore issuer. We will keep records because uh, otherwise uh, there's no such records being kept since there's no profit tax uh, implication. If the Islamic bond is marketed in Hong Kong and by the issuer, well, that would uh, force under carriers on a tray. But that would be different if uh, there's an intermediary involved. Uh, there's a, a lot of case case law on what will be caught by uh, pers by the definition of carrying on a trade profession uh, or business. The ILD 
has a wide experience on what is meant by uh, carrying on a trade, profession, or business. Any other questions about section 24? If not, then uh, I will uh, stop here. Next time, we will meet on the 30th of uh, April at 10.45. Uh, meetings adjourned today. Thank you.